And you're live. Hello from Tom and James from the Cricket Club at Google Plus, and welcome to a very different kind of hangout to what Cricket Club regulars might be used to. But then today is a very special day because today we are celebrating the publication of the 150th anniversary, sorry, 150th edition of the Wisden Cricketers' Almanac. Founded in 1864, Wisden has become a byword for authority and accuracy among cricket lovers. And here with us today to discuss Wisden, we are fortunate to have Lawrence Booth, editor of Wisden, uh, Dilip Premachandran, editor of the recently formed Wisden India, and Gideon Hay, cricket writer, journalist, and frequent contributor. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. If you're watching, uh, we'd love to get your questions. So for those who are watching on YouTube or on Google+, just post it into the comment stream underneath the video, and we'll try to get to your questions over the course of today. Um, but to kick off with, Lawrence, could you give us a quick introduction to Wisden and uh, the history of the Wisden Cricketing Almanac? Yeah, sure. Um, funnily enough, it was uh, started by a gentleman called Wisden, John Wisden, who was uh, a strapping five foot four inch seven stone weakling of a fast bowler uh, for Sussex in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, he was most famous for, for bowling all ten of his victims in a first class game, which is a, a record that, that still stands today. He was also an entrepreneur. He, uh, he opened a, a cigar and cricket shop uh, in the 1850s in London. And he wanted a, an almanac or a, a cricket annual to, to, to rival um, a chap called Lily White, who, who was running his own uh, cricket book at the time. And, and Wisden eventually won out. Uh, it, it hung around. Uh, John Wisden himself had various other business interests uh, over the years, but the, the almanac has remained. And as you said, a, a byword for, for various nice uh, um, abstract nouns. Uh, and it's still here, remarkably. Absolutely. And um, Gideon, uh, just looking back, sort of, you published a lot of work on the history of cricket in the past. Could you give us an idea of what cricket would have looked like back in uh, 1864? Well, that's a good question. It's a, it, the first edition was published actually in the year that, uh, that overarm bowling was, uh, was made legal. So it's, it's a very important sort of precondition to, uh, to the modernization of, of cricket. happens in the same year as, as Wisden is published. It's also the... Uh, the year that W.G. Grace, who was then 15 years old, played his first major innings. He made 170 and sort of announced himself to uh, to the cricket public. So uh, it's both the the year of the foundation coincides with the emergence of probably the major technical innovation in the, uh, in, the in the history of cricket, the graduation to overarm bowling, and the emergence of its first great personality. Uh, what Lawrence doesn't mention there is that the uh, the first Wisdoms were uh, were pretty paltry and, and inferior to uh, to Lily White's guide. I mean, it was a very small and quite a slender and insubstantial volume when Wisdom was first published. The interesting thing about Wisdom is, in terms of its packaging, is that although it it actually has changed very little in two dimensions, it's changed enormously in in the third dimension. Uh, particularly in the period from sort of the 1880s through to the 1920s where it grows from around about 200 pages to about 1,000 pages. It's, sort of, it's, it's the emergence of the, the era of quantification in cricket. It's the era when we become obsessed with records, we become obsessed with scores, and we become obsessed with the Ashes as well. Uh, I think that the Ashes plays, plays a very important role in Wisdom establishing itself because uh, the pardons, Sydney and Charles Pardon, who uh, successfully overhauled Wisdom in the 1880s, recognised that the rivalry between England and Australia was going to be fundamental to cricket in the future. They dedicated a lot of resources to, to covering Anglo-Australian cricket and kind of rode that, that tidal wave of interest in the, uh, in the two countries. So Gideon, what is it that you think about Wisden has made it um, stand the test of time? Because I can think of very few publications that have survived over 150 years. Um, and are still kind of the authoritative voice within that field. Um, is it because it's deeply rooted in such like big cricket, cricket events like the Ashes? Hmm. I think it's the, um, I mean, it's interesting that, that Wisdom, there were the two major breaks in international cricket, of course, from 1912 to 1920 and, uh, and in the Second World War as well. It's interesting that Wisdom continued to publish through those periods as an active kind of keeping faith with its public. 
Uh, there's no guarantee, I think, if Wisden had suspended publication, that, uh, that the publication would have survived. As it was throughout that period, it provided a sort of a continuous thread to, uh, to uh, the cricket community. And, and in doing so, I think it, um, it became a sort of a recognisable totem of, of cricket, which perhaps had a need for one. Uh, it's almost as though there was a, maybe a wisdom-shaped space in, in cricket, and it just so happened that wisdom was, was capable of filling it. And Dilip, turning to you, um, wisdom may look the same from the front as it did 150 years ago, but uh, cricket certainly doesn't. Um, being in India and sort of watching the IPL and all the sort of newest evolutions in cricket, how has wisdom changed over the years to accommodate the shorter forms of the game and the more commercial forms of the game? Well, I think Wisdom covers the short forms of the game uh, in, in kind of exhaustive detail. I know uh, I flipped through the online section yesterday during the dinner and I saw many forecasts for each game. Uh, and there's obviously a, a wrap of what happened the previous season in every issue. Uh, we obviously at Wisdom India need to cover it in, in slightly more detail than that uh, because it is very central to, to what uh, where Indian cricket is at right now. So uh, you'll obviously see a lot more on the IPL in, in coming years, not just uh, uh, reports of the match, because I don't think there's much value in a 200-word uh, report of a 2020 game. I think uh, the focus will be definitely more on how the 2020 game is changing uh, the rest of cricket as we know it, what impact it's having on players' techniques and... and on international schedules and all of that. And, and this is something that uh, people like Gideon have written about extensively over the past five years that the IPL has been in operation. And uh, I've seen essays by other people in the, in the British Almanac as well. Okay, great. And then also in terms of uh, sort of adapting to the digital age, um, obviously, I think, I think this is Wisdom's first Google Plus Hangout, I would assume. So um, how are you guys thinking about the internet and wisdom going from a book which weighs almost two pounds to being a website and a source of information online. Shall I to answer that? I mean, it's it's probably the the single the single most important issue for wisdom at the moment is how an annual adapts to the internet age. Statistics are updated by the second on the web. There are times with wisdom when the statistics are out of date even before the book's been published. Published so. Uh, we have to be careful about that. We, we've migrated more of our statistics to the web, so the, the record section has, has decreased in the past couple of years. Um, but I think that, you know, numbers in wisdom, the, the stats section is still a fundamental part of the experience of reading wisdom. You don't pick up wisdom and go from page one to page 1584 sequentially, as, as it will be this year. Um, you jump around and, and, and the numbers as part of the experience of browsing it, you, you might see a, a record table that triggers off a thought about an article you read before or a match report, and, uh, and, and, and you move around. So though we have to be careful about how we present statistics now, we also have to remember that it's an integral part of the, the reading experience of wisdom, and that reading experience is quite a unique one. And touching on the kind of digital age, how do you think it will impact the consumption of cricket? Um, I remember 10, 15 years ago, during the Ashes, we would just leave the television on for 10 hours, come in and out. Um, every time you'd hear a scream from another room and go back in to see which English player had been bowled out. But now, you know, the recent emergence of alternative commentary, um, lots of people are watching with a second screen, so they want much more in-depth stats as they're watching. Or well, even now with the IPL, you can go in and watch any of the games on YouTube, but it feels uh, it's like a destination, more of a commitment to maybe an hour or two hours of your time. So do you think that even the way that cricket is consumed may have a future impact on formats of the game and actually would converge to a shorter form? I mean, do, do you want me to take that, uh, Lawrence? Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, no, I... I I was talking about this last night uh, with somebody because we had an 18 year old write for us uh, I think two or three months ago on, on how the younger generation consumes cricket uh, and I was fascinated by how much it, it referred to Twitter and Facebook and other social networking sites and, and generally a, a sort of alternate uh, 
comments here almost like you, you're watching the game maybe on television or on the internet, but at the same time, instead of listening to what the official commentators are saying, in most cases because they tend to be silenced or, or what's the word, controlled by, uh, by broadcasters and the boards to say only certain things, more and more people are engaging with their friends on Twitter or, or listening to uh, you know what other ex-players have to say about uh, what's going on in the game right now and, and there's an entire separate uh, space being created where people can go and, uh, and discuss things. You've got uh, a test match so far on air now which will uh, cover test matches not just including um, uh, matches that involve Engl England but I think recently they did England, uh, India Australia as well. You've got uh, this entire new space and I think uh, one uh, one reason why journalism becomes even more important now is because there is such an information overload that you really do need somebody to step back and and make try and make sense of what's going on. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we face, whether it's at uh, a Wisdom India website or while editing the Almanac or you know just writing on the game as a columnist. Uh, I mean, I, I'd be fascinated to hear Gideon's views on that. I think Gideon's on mute, actually. Gideon, I don't think yeah. we can hear <laughs> Right. Certainly better. That's better. Yeah. All right. I was going to say that that probably runs counter to, um, to other trends in the game uh, among authorities to monetize cricket, um, to sort of try and exploit everything that moves, to assert their intellectual uh, property rights, uh, the cricket that they produce, the, uh, the access that they afford, the media, even the, uh, the the accreditation they disperse. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's still true to say that um, that ESPN Crick Info uh, isn't able to attend games of the, of the IPL because um, uh, the BCCI has existing commercial arrangements that uh, that ESPN's um, uh, business runs runs counter to. And I suspect that we'll probably see more of that. Uh, there's a lot of people in cricket running around now with intellectual property as, uh, as their main preoccupation. And you might see that Wisdom's role actually gets squeezed as it becomes more important. Um, just going back to a point that Dilip was saying around uh, information overload, um, I was reading that this year's edition doesn't include the laws, which is, I think, traditional for uh, Wisdom to include and potentially as a move away from sort of being purely referenced and uh, maybe more towards something which is a bit more editorial um, in the fact that you can always look at the laws online. Uh, is this a conscious decision or can you see this role of rather than just providing the information to overload people but actually just trying to understand it and give people a point of view? Yeah, well, we removed the laws last year actually um, and the laws had been removed a couple of times in the past. Uh, a couple of editors tried it uh, for one-off attempts and it, and, it, and it didn't go down too well but, but, but things have changed since then. Um, the internet is now a, a fact we cannot ignore and I, I just felt that we had about 60 pages of a, an already big book bit unchanging each year that seemed to run counter to what we're trying to do with Wisdom when people can access uh, the laws on, on MCC's website at the click of a click of a mouse uh, we, we have pledged that if a, if a law changes we'll, we'll explain that that change but until then it, it, it seems uh, like a waste of space and, and, and good forests to, to keep printing uh, the laws in wisdom. And, you know, wisdom's always evolved. And I guess that's a good example of, of how it's having to change now um, to keep, keep up with the web. And I guess also um, the... Uh, oh, sorry, Gideon, go for it. I was just going to say, is there, is, there a, is there a kind of a critical mass that wisdom can't reach? Dawson, is there a you know is the, can wisdom not be bigger than a certain number of pages? I, I haven't been given a set number of pages. Yeah. Um, but but they are conscious of the fact that they don't want it to get too unwieldy. I mean, it's interesting that if you go to press boxes now, when I first started in the game, you'd see about ten or twelve wisdoms kicking around the press box. Now, I mean, you can't fit them in your pocket. You you can barely fit them in your laptop bag, and you probably won't get through security with them. They'd regard it as a sort of lethal weapon. 
So we have to keep it. We're trying to trim it down. I mean, last year's book was 96 pages shorter than the 2011 Wisdom. This year's book happens to be slightly longer, but that was always going to be the case with the 150th. And the plan is for next year's book to, to, to cut down again. So we want to see people bringing their wisdoms to the game and, and not being put off because it weighs so damn much. I mean, we've, we've been criticized by some old timers in India for making the book thinner than the original one. Ours is 800 pages, I think. And, and to me, it's still the size of a brick. So it's not really something you can carry around uh, in your pocket, like you said. Or, or just uh, casually read while you're, you know, taking the tube or, or the bus or whatever it is. It's, it's not really a very portable book. I guess one of the benefits of moving online is that all of a sudden you have uh, as much space as you want at that point. So you still, the de decision is you let it just expand forever online, um, as the sort of OED does. They only printed, I think, two editions of the OED and it barely fit inside a van. Um, or do you still try and have that? editorial view and try and keep it short and manageable. Well it's, it's, it's got to be manageable but then you know wisdom is an anachronism in any case and <laughs> trying to make sense of it is, is almost futile. But people, a lot of people buy wisdom because they collect it and they like the look of it on their shelves, they like that yellow hue, it's somehow reassuring and if wisdom suddenly shrunk to half the length it is now there would be uproar, they'd be, they'd be walking on the streets of, of Alton in Hampshire which is where wisdom's offices are based. So we have to balance it out. We have to balance out the needs of the web with this very weird tradition. You know, wisdom should not exist, but it does, and we have to we have to kind of manage that, that expectation. Gideon, I think you had a point. I was just pointing to uh, to my wisdoms at the top of the screen. So there you go. <laughs> that that is a fine collection. A thin yellow line. <laughs> Um, I think Michael Palin called it the yellow brick road last night, and, and it's true. I mean, each one is the size of a brick. So, uh, I'd love to get on to the recently announced um, Player of the Year and the Top Five of the Year. Um, so, Wisdom's I think it's called Leading Cricketer of the Year this uh, 2012. Michael Clark obviously has a fantastic year with the bat, and potentially not such a fantastic year as a captain, and given where Australia are right now. Um, we were wondering whether Michael Clark was the right choice and what kind of went into that decision. Um, well, of course, it's based on 2012, so the 4-0 defeat in India didn't come into play. Michael Clark scored four double centuries. He turned one of them to a triple, and not even Don Bradman scored four double centuries in a year. Uh, actually, you mentioned his captaincy. I thought his captaincy was, was pretty good most of the time. He's, he's quite imaginative, at least. He won a test match in, in the Caribbean declaring behind, which had happened about three times in, in test history. Um, sometimes he might get a bit gimmicky. He brought a wicket keeper on to bowl uh, an over in, in a test in the Caribbean. But, you know, there are signs that he's a, he's a lateral thinker about the game, and there aren't many of those around. You, I was in India for, for, for the England tour. We had MS Dhoni, who chases the ball the whole time, against Alistair Cook, who... Uh, is still new and is has that English orthodoxy about him as, as Strauss did. So, look, Clark could could win a test um, off his own using his own brain power in, in England this summer, uh, and England will be hoping that his his purple patch and the law of averages um, will finally catch up with him. So, talking about Clark and Cook, um, it feels like a good time to make some predictions for the Ashes. Um, if he does maintain his form, do you think he can take them back to Sydney with him? Someone else want to do that? Uh, what I watched of Australia and India last uh, month, uh, I, I don't think they will do that unless they find another two batsmen to support Clark. I, I think there's a fantastic group of young fast bowlers there if they can keep them fit. Um, was really impressed by Pattinson and, and there are a couple of other guys there. Uh, I'm not sure what Ryan Harris's fitness is for a test series, but uh, they definitely have a group of bowlers who can do well in England. I'm not so sure about the bat. And Gideon, what's your money on this uh, this Ashes? It's hard, isn't it? I mean, over the course of a 10 test match uh, course, uh, an awful lot of black swan events could intrude. Uh, if Mitchell Johnson 
you know, breaks Alistair Cook's hand in the first over of the series at Trent Bridge, all of a sudden all the predictions that we've made have to be recalibrated. Uh, no one foresaw Glenn McGrath stepping on the ball at, um, at Edgbaston in 2005. It does seem that there is, in the course of a series that long, there are going to be all sorts of unexpected events that, uh, that, that we can't incorporate it. But I think Dilip's remarks are absolutely sound. I mean, uh, and the, the, the trouble is that I think this is the best team that Australia is choosing at the moment. There's, there's not three or four outstanding players that they're just willfully not choosing. This is a fair reflection of the depth of, of talent and resources in Australian cricket, and it's in a pretty sorry state. And um, on the sort of top five cricket of the year, obviously three of them, uh, Hashim Amla, Dale Stein and Jack Callis, all from the South Africa team. Um, I actually think South Africa have been sort of under-regarded um, over the last few years. Everyone was talking about England getting to number one, and then South Africa put that straight very convincingly. Um, I mean, I, I personally think the South Africa team is, is one of, is a, potentially a very great team. I'd love to hear the panel's views on, on South Africa at the moment. Yeah, I think they're deservedly number one at the moment. Uh, I mentioned in the, the editor's notes this year that between England's series against South Africa last summer and their next series against South Africa, which is 2015-16, they would have played 24 test matches against Australia and India, um, which gives you an indication of, of the extent to which those three countries, the three richest countries in world cricket, are carving up the schedule to suit their own purposes, regardless of, of how good South Africa are. They had a three-test series in England last summer, which was uh, a disgrace, really. It should have been at least four and, and preferably five. Uh, they blame the Olympics, but that wasn't right because they played three tests against West Indies as well. They're, they've got every base covered, South Africa, um, apart from possibly a top-class spinner. But even even Robin Peterson seems to be chipping in with his sort of slow left arm nothings, and that's a sign of a good team when they can turn those sort of utility men into um, into into handy guys. So look, they they are the team to beat at the moment. Yeah, I think it's six years with the defeat uh, away from home, more than six years, and that that's a phenomenal record. It's the kind of record that I think only Australia matched, uh, well, I wouldn't say a generation ago, but say a decade ago. Uh, I think what held South Africa back for a long time was their home record in the Kills Art series against England in 2009-10, against India a year later. I think they lost it to the West Indies a couple of years before that. So it was a home record, especially the Durban record that kept uh, bringing them down. But now they seem to have sorted that out as well. My big question mark is what happens when Jack Callis goes in. A couple of others who are maybe not uh, as young as uh, the core group of, say, the English or the Australian team. The transition is something that they'll probably have to look at in a couple of years' time. In Callis' case, maybe even after next season. Yeah, I mean, Callis is irreplaceable, and he's 37, and, um, you know, he's like Old Man River, but uh, you can't always keep rolling along. Uh, I think Smith and, um, and Peterson, Alvaro Peterson, are 32. The rest of the team, though, are sort of in their late 20s. And they're absolute cricket problem. I think Armour might have turned 30 by now. But uh, there's a whole group of players who've grown up more or less as... as Years as as, um, as contemporaries have played a lot of cricket together and have never been in better form and are coming into their um into their at their cricket peak. I guess the question is further down the track, do they all retire simultaneously and leave South Africa in the same kind of hole that Australia now finds itself? I also wonder if 30, uh, 31 in Smith's case is the same as thirty one in somebody else's case because uh, there's, there are a lot of miles in those legs. He's captain for a decade now. I'm sure at some point that wears you down, and I, I don't know what it does for your appetite in the game. Because I've, I've spoken to a couple of ex international captains who said five years and you know, it was enough. I mean, you, you just had to move on. That's a very good point. I think um, English fans have get to see Graham Smith in action of Surrey this year in the uh, County Championship. So clearly he must love the game enough to come to England in April and start playing uh, in about four degrees temperature at the Oval. Um, okay, and maybe we could uh, sort of moving on to the shorter form. Oh, sorry, Gideon. I'm just going to continue. Smith's record of having been captain for so long and having been singled out to become a captain so early in his career 
must be unique in the annals of cricket. I, I can remember having a uh, having dinner with a South African uh, historian actually in Boxing Day Test match in 2001, and South Africa had struggled during the day. Sort of Kirsten was coming towards the end of his career, um, and, I, and I said to him, "Is there anyone in South African cricket at the moment who?" looks like he you know, could be an opening batsman. And he said, there's a fellow called Smith. He's playing provincial cricket at the moment. He hasn't played a test match yet, but he'll be captain within two years. And it was already known in South African cricket that Smith had this, this X factor, this extra quality about him. And it's um, so many cricketers disappoint when they have raps on them like that early in their career. The fact is that Smith was always expected to be great and, and fulfilled all those expectations. I think also with, with Smith, he um, he benefits from the fact that South Africa's players aren't overworked to the extent that England's, India's and Australia's are. That it was interesting, when Andrew Strauss became the third successive England captain to quit because uh, Smith had forced him out last summer, uh, he, he'd been captain for... That, that, that second stint of his, he, he, he was there in 2006 briefly, but that main stint of his, he'd been captain for 45 tests in that three and a half year period. Graham Smith in the same period had been captain for 27 tests, which I think tells you something about uh, the way in which he's been managed. I mean, simply as a function of the fact that South Africa aren't as in demand financially. I mean, cricket-wise they should be, but not financially, and, and that's helped extend his reign. And do you think um, there's a lot of talk of the world sort of test, test World Cup, test World Cup, test, test Championship? Might that rebalance uh, this problem that you're mentioning that the top three teams, India, Australia, England, are playing a huge amount and the other teams are potentially being ignored a little bit? Might that give the opportunity for teams like South Africa, New Zealand, and West Indies to get a bit of international exposure and a bit of money? No, well, I don't think they want to share slices of the pie. Uh, I think the the fundamental reason is that these three boards do not want to share their profits with anybody else. So, uh, until that changes, till that mindset changes, uh, a test championship will just be a sham because you'll have uh, England and Australia and India playing each other about 20 times in four years. I, I think I did the numbers a couple of weeks ago. And South Africa, if they're lucky, they'll get one series against each of these teams in that same period. And if you're Pakistan, Sri Lanka, New Zealand, West Indies, well, just forget it because you'll get two tests somewhere shoehorned into the early part of the summer or in between Diwali and Christmas in India, something like that. that that's all you get. Yeah, it is almost incredible that uh, we not only have the 10 test matches, 10 simultaneous Ashes test matches, but we have, I think, in England, Australia goes back to England in 2000. And 15, is that right? Yeah. I mean, I, how did that happen? I so far can't find anyone to give me a coherent explanation. There isn't one. Um, there, there is a vaguely... Well, listen, I've tried to find out. There's a vaguely coherent explanation for 10 back-to-back -back Ashes tests. I mean, it's spurious, but the, the explanation is that the ECB wanted to get away from winters where England played in Ashes and a World Cup. Of course, Australia never seemed too troubled by it, but uh, England decided they didn't want that. It, I mean, it, you have to go back to the start of the 20th century to find a, a period in which so many Ashes tests, 15 in, in essentially the space of two years, were played. And back then, there were only three teams. There was a reason for it then. There's a reason for it now, which is money. But, you know, the, the magic will be lost. And the administrators, they'll, look at, they'll say, look, full houses, people still want to watch Ashes cricket. But that sort of misses the point, I think. Isn't it funny how we tend to uh, devalue each of the iconic series by doing that? Uh, I remember the same thing happened with India and Pakistan between 2004 and 2007 when the relationship was renewed. We went to Pakistan in 2004, they came back in 2005, we went to get in 2006, they came back in 2007. And by the end of that, I was like, uh, I'd be happy if I never had to cover and in the Pakistan match again, because you get so much nonsense around them anyway. And, and in, return, in addition to that, you have all these really boring pitches because people are terrified of losing to one another. And, and it just made for a really sad spectacle and, and exactly what you don't want around one of the games, so-called big rivalries. So I think given that we have a 
Uh, very exciting IPL match coming up tonight. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about it. Very keen to get some predictions. Um, my personal opinion is that the two teams playing today have a very good chance of winning the tournament, um, Chennai and Bangalore. Um, it would be great to get your thoughts on the players who are currently performing well um, and which teams you think will make it all the way through to the final. Is that for me? It's for everyone. We'll do a sweepstake and then revisit this in six weeks. <laughs> no, I think uh, I think one of the things that's happened with the IPL, sadly, again, because of the, of the money factor, I mean, ultimately everything seems to come down to money, is that you've got a, a, a league within leagues now. You've got... Uh, uh, significantly richer teams like Mumbai, uh, Chennai, uh, Bangalore, and I think Kolkata uh, Knight Riders would uh, would fit into that list as well. Who were either backed by big business or by very rich individuals, and and they uh, on the surface you have a salary cap. Everyone knows that that's not really strictly enforced, and that there are payments on the table. So you've got a mini league of teams who you expect to be at the top of the table every year. Uh, it's become a bit like the, uh, the English Premiership in that regard, and I've, I've been disappointed by that because I don't think you'll see a situation like season one where you have a Shane Warne coming in and taking a ride sun rolls from, uh, I think, the bookies rank outsiders to, to the tournament title. So I'd be surprised if that happened this year. I think one team that might break that mould um, are the Sunrisers. I have to say, going into the tournament, I didn't have any players in my fantasy team. Um, really didn't have high expectations for them going through, but they've made an incredible start. I think their bowling attack is probably second to none in the tournament so far. And but really again, they're backed, by, they're backed by a lot of money. Sunrises are owned by the Sun TV Group, which also owns SpiceJet Airlines. So they, they don't really have to worry about uh, paying the fares this season or next season. They've got the money in the bank. Uh, and I think you, you're finding that more and more that uh, big business plays such an essential role. And the, and the teams that are not bankrolled by the big corporations are, are going to struggle going forward. So do you think yeah. there's a chance that teams like Pune could actually drop off and maybe not be in a league in a couple of seasons? Who knows? I mean, we, we've already had two teams either drop off or, or be shut down. Uh, no one really knows uh, the exact reasons for either because if you're talking about flouting the rules, other teams have done that as well. Uh, it, it's very complicated. And, and it's not regulated when, when the board owns the competition uh, and is also responsible for running Indian cricket as well. Uh, it's hard for anyone else to, to question why this has happened because you're never going to get an explanation. You're not going to get uh, a proper explanation of why Team A has been chucked out and why Teams B and C are still in the competition. Yeah, the lower reaches, the um, I think the quality of the um, of the IPL franchises falls off pretty markedly. Uh, Pune do look a very ordinary team to me. I think they've they've played three and they've lost three, and they've I think they've already got a negative net run rate of two. Uh, that's not an auspicious start. They've got Taylor, they've got Samuels, but um, but apart from that, um, they look like a real battling team. I think Kings Eleven and Punjab already look like. Um, they're struggling a bit. Um, Adam Gilchrist looks as though he's finding it harder and harder just to play cricket for, for two months of the year. Uh, so it's um, they've got a pretty long tail, as they demonstrated the other night. Uh, once again, it's going to be fought out by the um, Olympic Italians. Um, great to watch them on by Indians, actually, with, with Ponting and, and Tindulkar and Harbishan together in the in the same side. That's part of the weird fascination of, of watching that franchise, watching Harbishan and Ponting celebrate that wicket the other night. Oh, dear. It was, I wonder if they realised the irony of that. It was glorious to see. It was one of the great moments, wasn't it, the, the hug between Harbishan and Ponting, um, bringing nations together, you know, people, People used to the Bolly the the, the Bolly line series one of the most acrimonious and Harbajan has, has said all sorts of things about um, Ponting his bunny but well, I, don't, I don't have many rules in life but but one of them is never look beyond Chennai Super Kings and I'm I'm sticking with that. 
I'm going to get Anim and go for RCB. I think on the right day, uh, people can't touch them. If they find a bit of consistency in the top four, um, very hard to beat. And then the one team that you could always confidently say have a chance of scoring over the season. Uh, we've got a question from an uh, audience member I just want to throw out. This is um, not IPR related. Um, from Bill Fermage. Uh, who, in your opinion, was the greatest player never to have been named one of the Wisdom Cricketers of the Year? Oh. Well, in fact, Sh Shield Berry commissioned a, a piece on this um, two, two or three years ago, and he named the five that the, the five greatest players never to have been chosen. And goodness me, it's put me on the spot now. I know Jeff Thompson was in there. Uh, Inza Mammal Hack was there. Um, so probably one of those two. <laughs> um, I mean, Jeff Thompson would would have a good shout just because of the impact he made at the time. But of course, the, you know, the, because the emphasis is on the English summer, some some strange guys have missed out. It was odd that that Callis wasn't hadn't been chosen until now. Except it wasn't when you looked at the criteria and in pr three previous tours of England, he'd he'd never done um, a huge amount, and his, his rare. Uh, outings in county cricket had been had been good, but not quite good enough. So, it's it's a strange award in that respect, and and, and some can slip through the net. But maybe maybe Tomo was the sort of highest impact uh, cricketer not to have won it. I'm uh, I'm not sure Bishan Bedi won it either, and, and Bedi was one of the five. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that would be my my first pick uh, from an Indian perspective. I probably think of Bedi was. One who missed out. Who's the worst player to be one of the five? If we were to rank from oh. one to infinity, where would where would the who would come out the bottom? Crikey! Um, I, all I can say is I hope Ian Austin isn't following this Google Hangout. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the IPL, something that's fascinated me for the past six years. It's how terribly bad the English players have done in the auction. I originally kind of excused us because of the fact that we usually had summer test series coming up um, and they knew they wouldn't necessarily get the best value for money. But it doesn't seem to stop the teams bidding very highly for Australian players. Um, it's very strange for me to see people like um, Swan not being, despite his injury, the past couple of years he's missed out. Um, so I'd love to get your thoughts on. Why, despite, you know, in some of the T20 and ODI rankings, English players do incredibly well, but seem to miss out or just not be attracted to the IPL team. Uh, I can explain that uh, very simply. I mean, I've spoken to plenty of guys at the franchises about this. Uh, Australian players remain attractive because even if they miss out the first a uh, couple of weeks or three weeks of the IPL, they're usually always around for the business end. Uh, with English players, what happens, even uh, Kevin Peterson last year, he played brilliantly the first two or two and a half weeks, then went back to England. Uh, and you don't get them for for the final stages, or the semis and the finals or the eliminator, whatever they call it right now. Uh, you don't get them around and, and franchises are reluctant to spend big money on players they don't, they, are, they can't use for the biggest games of the season. And do you think that long term that will impact the quality of 2020 cricket in England? The fact that these guys aren't being exposed to so much match play in high pressure situations? I, I don't know. I think Lawrence is better equipped to answer that. Um, I think it is a bit of an issue, but you know, England won the World 2020 in 2010. They made a bit of a mess of it in, in Sri Lanka last September, but mainly I think because um, Kevin Peterson had fallen out with the team. If he'd been there, uh, think things may have been different. There are some good, there are some big hitting guys coming through. I mean, Joss Butler has the potential to be a bit of a superstar, I think, when he comes off. Johnny Bairstow will, will come again. I was in India a couple of years ago when there was a, a warm-up match in Hyderabad and he hit 100 off about 57 balls and and okay, the attack wasn't great, but it was the kind of innings that you could imagine him playing in front of packed houses. He's got to sort out his technique against spin, but that will come. Stephen Finn is an exceptional limited overs bowler. He's still got some work to do in test cricket. 
I mean, you know, does the fact they're not playing in the IPL affect things? Possibly, but you know, ha has it really helped India's 2020 uh, international cricket? I'm not sure it has. They they won the World T20 in 2007 before the IPL existed, uh, and and haven't really done much since then. So I think we we sometimes we we overstress the correlation between the two. Mm. And talking of best though. Um, you were talking before about how Callis is simply irreplaceable. Um, I think as a huge England fan, I know Tom feels the same. Matt Pryor is a real rock um, and someone who is very hard to replace. But do you think that can be best though? Or do you think maybe just that there? Or even in the next couple of years, do you see us actually having two or three wicket keepers in the team just as batters? Because I think there's a good, really good crop of young English wicket keepers coming to uh, yeah, no, you go, Gideon. I was just going to say that it reminds me of the, the situation that we're in in Australia at the moment, where um, where we probably get got the fourth or fifth best keeper in Australia doing the job for us at the moment on the grounds that you know he will get us some runs with the uh, with the bat. But I think that Wade has has proven quite um, inconsistent and fallible behind the stumps over the over the last six months, and and that was revealed more clearly in India where he didn't get the runs. To, uh, to mask that when he when he went into bat, and I think for a for a struggling team, there's always going to be a temptation to choose the guy who can get you a few extra runs, and it might be a mark of confidence to choose the best keeper going around. I'm 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 a bit more traditional when it comes to keepers. I'm not completely convinced that you can simply manufacture them out of good batsmen or uh, or good or good athletes. Uh, Wade to me looks a little bit like a manufactured keeper at the moment, and in the course of a five day game. Uh, these limitations are, are being exposed. Right. Um, we just had another question come in from Google Plus um, from Shyan Sundararam. I suppose it's going to come up at some point, um, but he'd love to hear your take on Homework Gates and Shane Watson. Uh, mine? Um, well, I mean, I think Australian cricket's got a, got a, got a cultural problem. Uh, in the generation of cricketers who are about to inherit the key positions in the Australian side have matured in ways quite different to uh, to, to those before them. Uh, they're players who have been uh, fast-tracked through um, underage systems, uh, through the centre of excellence. They've played under 17s, under 19s, um, under 23s for Australia. They've been made to feel um, special their, their whole way through. Through. They've bypassed our traditional first-class structures. I think they're um, they play cricket because they're good at it, not necessarily because they love it. And the idea of actually uh, analysing it, um, the idea of actually thinking about it, uh, thinking on their feet, doesn't come naturally to them. I'm not necessarily talking about the players who are involved in homework gate, but the next generation of, of players who will become our key players uh, over the next four or five years. And I think the dispute manifested some frustration in the Australian setup about the, uh, the, the level of buy-in of, of, of some of these players, the fact that they were prepared to sort of coast along and, um, and, and have things done for them, and, and perhaps that became more obvious and more palpable after the retirement of Ricky Ponting and Michael Hussey. I don't think Homework Gate would have happened if, if Hussey or Ponting would have been on, that, on the tour. As kind of sort of cultural leaders or, um, or or inspirational forces, it did at the same time expose the the kind of the over management of Australian cricket. I think that it seemed to me almost unaccountable that the players involved could have been unaware that their failure to provide this submission to Mickey Arthur could have resulted in their suspension from the Australian team. That just seems to me to be a total management failure and symptomatic of a, of a huge communications and cultural breakdown. It's still not clear to me exactly what uh, the hierarchy within the Australian team was, was trying to encourage. Did they want players to, uh, to become thinkers about the game? Did they want them to initiate? Or did they simply want them to obediently follow orders to comply with instructions? Do we want leaders in Australian cricket, or do do we simply want another generation of followers? Even now, I'm not quite sure. 
That's that's great, thank you. Um, I think we're getting to the time where we need to wrap up. Um, so thank you very much for celebrating um, a very special day with us on Google Plus. I do hope it won't be the last thing that was in there. Um, but before we go, we should just do a quick round of room and get final predictions in, and then maybe we'll all uh, we'll all re meet here in six weeks to see who was right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with Bangalore. Um, I'll be forever drawn to Chris Bale. Um, I'll always want them to win just so I can see him hit 100. Uh, Dilly, it's time to put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> uh, I, I have to go with you on that. I, I strongly feel that Bangu have a good chance this year. Uh, anytime Chris comes off, they tend to win the game. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd have to go with RCB this year. Not just because I live in Bangalore. <laughs> Gideon? Oh, well, I can't say the same, can I, really? Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see the Mumbai Indians do it with, with Ponting in the captaincy um, and, you know, running Tendulkar out maybe in the first over of the final <laughs> or something like that, creating a huge schism in uh, Australian-Indian relations. Uh, the, the team that I'm actually quite looking forward to watching is the Royals because I love watching Dravid bat under any circumstances and watching him adapt that classical technique to T20 cricket is an object of... Is, is, a, a continued fascination to me. It was great to see how well they fielded the other night. I think we underestimate the impact that, you know, sort of high energy fielding can have. You know, Hodge executed that brilliant run out the other night. Rahani took that fantastic catch. Uh, I think there, it, it might be the fact that those kind of, um, those kind of decisive uh, interventions by fielders uh, in, a, in a close competition uh, might be decisive. I, th I think any team that has um, MS Dhoni in it, it means they're in every single run chase and, until they need 37 off the last over. So um, I'm sticking with my rule of thumb, Chennai Super Kings. And Mr. Percy, last up. I guess, I guess someone like the Mumbai Indians that have such an amount of, sort of legendary talent into that team. I can't, I can't see magic not happening. I think I'd have to lose my faith in the fairy tale of cricket if they can't pull something, pull something out of the bag with, with Ponting and, uh, and Tendulkar in it. So I'm going to put my money on there. I might lose it, but there we go. Okay, good. Well, we'll closely monitor that and uh, keep people updated on Google Plus with the results. Thank you very much, guys. Um, for all of the cricket club fans watching, Stewie and Marte will be back in the next week with some of the coaches from IPL. Uh, to give us some more alternative commentary, and hopefully this won't be the last wisdom hangout. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye.